My video is a photographic tour of a 70-man living history logging camp from 1890 to 1910. My digital photos start out with a tour of the main building in Grand Rapids, Minnesota. The main building museum houses the story of the history of logging industry in Minnesota. You then hike out into the logging camp, cookhouse, lumberjack sleeping house, horse barn, superintendent's office, blacksmith shop, saw, sh saw sharpening hut, and more. This original 70-man lumber camp was picked up and moved every few years to a new location. Tracts of land would be purchased from the government or landowners. It was timber, not farm line, that first attracted European settlers to Minnesota. Having cut down forests from Maine to Wisconsin, lumber barons were eager for new sources of quality lumber. The forest of Minnesota promised a bountiful supply of such timber. The barons began to pressure Minnesota's native people to sell their lands in order to access the forest. In 1837, a treaty with the Ojibwa natives opened up the east-central Minnesota to logging. In 1849, the year Minnesota Territory was created, logging was at full speed in Wisconsin and Michigan. The lumber industry was harvesting throughout Wisconsin by 1820 and 1840 supplying lumber to Lake Michigan cities. The lumber camps were slowly moving towards Minnesota, which was not yet a state. Lumberjacks notched the tree to make it fall in the direction desired. After the tree was notched by the undercutter, the buckers completed the job of cutting the tree down with a two-man crosscut saw, then cutting them into logs. They only took the trunks, they cut off the limbs, tops and tossed them aside as waste or slash. This highly combustible material would lead to a devastating forest fires later. Logs were located onto large sleighs pulled by oxen down to the river. They were stacked, counted, and stamped, and in the spring floated down the rivers to the sawmills. As the demand for lumber increased, sawmills introduced new technology to process more wood. This, in turn, affected life in the camps. Crews grew larger, camps expanded, and specialized jobs developed. Draft horses replaced slow-moving oxen in the 1850s, and horses, in turn, were replaced by locomotives starting in the 1880s. The building of railroads to the region marked this transformation here in Minnesota. By 1886, more than 25,000 miles of railroads centered in Minneapolis, reached out to the entire upper Midwest. The period between 1870 and 1890 saw a massive expansion of timbering in Minnesota. Loggers cut deeper and deeper into the forest. By the 1930s, only remained in the state's most northern reaches. Wherever there was timber, there was a sawing mill operation. Sawmills were built next to rivers, which were both the highways that floated timber from the woods. In 1839, there was enough demand for construction lumber that a commercial lumbering began in Minnesota with the first sawmill. The sawmill was located on a stream that could power a mill called Marine on the St. Croix River. A year later, a second commercial mill was erected at Stillwater, which also has a good source of water power. In 1848, there was enough people in demand for building lumber, so sawmills were soon built in Minneapolis to process lumber from the Mississippi River Valley. Most processed lumber was sold and transported by horse and wagon to the expanding local communities. Further up the Mississippi and St. Croix Rivers, logging camps were erected each winter in a new location close to a fresh stand of pines. Logs were floated down to Stillwater, Winona, Minneapolis, and Prost for local construction. The following decade saw the invention of the steam-powered mills, which worked faster and could be built anywhere. 1870, steam power was introduced into sawmilling, replacing the need for water power and allowing sawmills to move to other river towns. In the 1870s, trains began to reach into Minnesota cities and small towns. 
In the 1880s, the forest of Michigan and Wisconsin began to give out. The nation turned to Minnesota as its major supply of wood. New mills sprung up around the state and further technology advances like more railroads to carry logs, larger sawmill engines, better saws, increased production again. Logging only lasted from 1840 to 1910 in Wisconsin. By 1910, Wisconsin was almost treeless and the farm, farming started to take over the economy. In 1890 to 1910 was the peak era of lumbering in Minnesota. Some 20,000 to 30,000 lumberjacks worked in the forest. A similar number of men toiled in the sawmills and another 20,000 worked in wood production factories. Each year until the peak, the state produced enough lumber to build 60,000 to 1 million homes a year. After 1910, the Minnesota harvests began to grow smaller. Sawmills began to close. Lumber companies moved out to the Pacific Northwest. In 1929, the Rainy Liver Lumber Company in Virginia, Minnesota shut down, ending the era of the large pine logging camps in the state. The camp foreman's job was to lay out the logging roads, supervise all the various logging activities, and make sure the men carried out their work properly. Stumps from the logging road were dynamited. The superintendent was in general charge and ordered the supplies necessary to keep the camp going. Often, they ran several camps in the area and traveled from one camp to another with a cutter and a team. The man who is in the business of estimating lumber as to quality and quantity was called a cruiser. Confidence was placed in this one man and his decision depended on thousands of dollars. When somebody had offered to sell certain descriptions of his land to the company, the cruiser is sent to check the timber before the sale is finalized. The particular description is estimated as to the amount of standing timber they contain. A cruiser would estimate as he walked along with mentally comparing the timber stands to known volume in his past experiences. Occasionally he might measure up a, a windfall and tree to get an accurate check on the height of the timber. Later developments in the timber cruising brought more scientific methods to estimating. Typically uneducated, low-skilled migrant workers, the lumberjacks undertook an enormous amount of labor requiring a diet of around 5,000 calories per day. The camp cook and his three assistants or cookies were hard pressed to stay ahead of the lumberjack's healthy appetites. Breakfast at an 80-man camp might call for 400 to 500 pancakes and a day's baking might be 20 pies and 30 loaves of bread. The workers worked six days a week from 5 a.m. to dust and when they were given Sunday off. Often on Saturday nights, the fiddler would play and the men would dance and play games. On their day off, they would do their dirty laundry and bath or just simply relax. The day begins with a breakfast around 4 a.m. The lumberjacks then would walk in pre-dawn darkness to their trees. Lunch was brought to them at 9 o'clock. A big midday dinner was served at 2 and then they'd walk back to camp for supper around 7. By nine, all were back in their bunks, resting for the next day. Everyone was usually in bed by 8 o'clock or 8.30 p.m., except on Saturday night. The cook announced breakfast by beating the familiar triangle, although it really wasn't necessary because everyone was up and waiting to eat. Pork and beans were the staple item in the lumberjack's diet. Sometimes it was served three times a day, Potatoes and meat were also seen on the table. Occasionally buckwheat cakes were served. The batter was poured directly on top of the big cooking range was served as a huge griddle. Most cooks allowed no talking at meals. Meals were disciplined, non-nonsense affairs. Each man had an assigned seat and conversation was limited to requests for bread, beans, and spuds. The men were in and out of the cook shack in 20 minutes given the kitchen staff time to clean up and begin the preparation for the next meal. The cook and cookies had bunks in the rear of the building, so the early rising went out to disturb with the other men. 
The cookies usually bought out lunch to the men in the woods, piping hot and big tin cans, which they hauled on one on a run runner bobsled. It was often eaten around a fire, and if the weather was cold or windy, the beans sometimes froze to the plate, and the men ate with their finger mittens on. During the logging season, the lumberjacks made their home in a rustic bunkhouse that often housed more than 70 at a time. The men slept two to a bunk on prickly mattresses of hay, one over the other. They sometimes lined their bunks with, with cedar in an effort to ward off bed bugs and gray bugs, the bothersome body lice that followed the jacks from camp to camp. There was a single long bench in front of the bunks called the deacon seat. This was the center of the lumberjack social life where they spent their evening playing cards, talking, and smoking. There was a long stove in the center which was fired with four-foot wood, mostly birch. Above the stove was a rack in which the men hung their socks at night to dry, about 150 pairs in all. Wooden sinks with tin wash basins were provided for the men to wash their faces and hands, and a barrel stood handy for, for which water could be gotten. Generally, there were three roller talls on which to dry off, and by the time 60 men these, used these talls, they were pretty wet. The lumberjacks' first task at a new site was to clear the area of trees to make room for the camp. They built their camps very hastily, paying more attention to speed than detail. They often left the bark on the logs used for their own buildings. The workers would sometimes take materials such as doors and uh, lumber with them from camp to camp to help expedite the next build. Most of the logging companies would log in the winter to take advantage of the frozen earth for better, move, mo better mobility and to be able to transfer the lumber by sleigh instead of wheeled wagons. Logging was done in the winter when dirt roads could be turned into ice roads in order to carry the 20-ton sleighs to the river twice daily. The camps had two dozen horses that the lumberjacks harnessed to drag logs to landings and to hoist them onto sleds. The horses hauled the sleds out into the woods and the logs were dumped onto the river banks to wait for spring. When the spring thawed, the lumberjacks drove the logs to the sawmills down the river. The roads were prepared for icing in the fall by a rut cutter, which cut a rut through the snow four inches wide and three inches deep for the sleigh runners to run. These ruts were then iced by the sprinkler, which is a wooden tank mounted on a sled. It was filled at the lake by means of a barrel dropped through a hole in the ice. The horse then pulled the barrel up the skids and dumped it into the tank. As the sprinkler moved along the road, a plug on each side of the tank was taken out to let the water run into the rut on the freeze. Men called road monkeys straightened out the ruts and filled the low places with snow. When the ruts were frozen solid, the heavy loads were moved along the road with ease. Moving logs is a simple concept of loading logs onto a sled and having horses or oxen pull the logs where they need to go. The hardest part is making an upkeep of the ice roads. Ice made it easy to move huge loads of lumber across long distances. Roads monkeys were used to clear future ice roads. They had to make sure the road be wide enough for sleighs full of lumber. After the road monkeys widened and cleared the road, a sprinkler would water down and a rudder would come behind and water would froze the road smooth. Steam-powered machinery was not introduced until the late 1800s, so in order to move the logs onto a sled required ingenuity. Before steam became available, jammers were made to load logs onto the sled. An A-fray jammer was the easiest to make since it only required three poles. Two poles would be connected at the top and a third pole became the swing boom, and a cable connected a team of horses to pull the log up. The timber around Grand Rapids was about 80% white pine, and the balance was Norway pine, spruce, and balsam fir. The density of the timber stand varied a great deal. Most white pine would produce four to five 16-foot logs per tree. The men who chopped the falling cut the trees were called undercutters. 
They were skilled in the use of a double-bitted axe and knew just where to notch the tree to make it fall in the direction desired. After the tree was notched by the undercutter, the buckers completed the job of cutting the tree down with a two-man cross-cut saw. Stump heights, 24 inches, were sometimes only 18 inches. After the tree was cut down, the undercutters marked the 12, 14, 16, and 18-foot lengths on the fallen tree so that the buckers could cut the tree up into logs. Then a man and a pair of horses together with a cant hook skidded the logs onto the rollways which were loaded parallel to the logging road. Preparatory to loading the sleds, the logs were decked up on the rollways 8 to 10 feet high by another team and man. A chant hook is a traditional logging tool consisting of a wooden lever handle and a mobile metal hook called a dog at one end, used for handling and turning logs and chants, especially in sawmills. The average load on a skid weighed 25 to 30 tons. The logs were loaded on skids by means of a cross haul. In logging, to load the logs by horsepower in a crotch or log loading chain. A team pulled each log up parallel skids on the sled. Two men with the chant hooks controlled the position of the log as it mounted on the skids. Another man called the top loader put each log in place on the load. Cross chains held each course of logs as the log was built. Insomuch as the logs weighed from a half a ton to two tons each, this was no easy feat. If necessarily, great still and experience combined with brute strength and the ability to pull and pry logs on the top of a slippery load, accidents were not uncommon. After 1906, logs were loaded by means of an A-frame and block and tackle, which was less hazardous to the men's. The sleds were driven out on the lake or side of the river until spring. It usually took two men to unload the logs. Supplies were sold to the men, such as shirts, boots, tobacco, stuff, etc. Any purchases were charged against the men's wages. In 1900, $30 a month in board for the saw men, undercutters, and teamsters. The swampers, common labor, received $26 per month, and the cook, $45. Most of the men used large quantities of snuff. The camp was often visited by peddlers. The U.S. government says that $45 in 1900 is equivalent to purchasing power of $1,345.16 in 2018. Plus, the loggers get free food. Uh, 900 farmland was kitted really cheap in those days. The camp medicine chest usually can tip any other things, Epsom salts, which the men used extensively, cough medicine, sarsaparilla, white ligament for sores and sore joints, and Johnson's ligament for sore throats. Hospitalization in Grand Rapids was provided for the lumberjackets by the Catholic sisters in Brainerd. They used to come through the camp selling hospital tickets to the men for either $3 or $5 each, which was a form of an insurance policy. Neither cards or liquor was allowed in the camp, and no gambling debts were honored on the books. This rule, together with long winters in the woods, may have accounted for the terrible rampages that some, some lumberjacks went on when they hit the town in the spring. The driving crew for the logs down river were most part comprised of different men than the winter crew. Many people marvel today at the huge masses of logs that could have been driven down such puny rivers with all the zigzags until they reached the Mississippi River. In the summertime, these streams are only about 10 feet wide. Successful driving of small streams was made possible by the construction of one or more log and earthwork dams. By patrolling the gates on these dams, enough water was impounded and then released to carry the logs down to the river. During the drive, the loggers are housed in one or more shelters mounted on a raft for sleeping, eating, and storage. The barge-like boats are the headquarters for the drive, serving as a floating cook shack and bunkhouse for the river drivers. The barge-like shelters which, which accompany the drive are about 25 or 30 feet long and about 9 feet wide, 
Each shelter carried a cook and bunks for 25 men. Meals were served on shore due to the lack of space. The drives took place during the long hours of May and June, and the men worked from dawn until dark. Breakfast was served at 4 a.m. and three other meals at 9 a.m., 3 p.m., and 9 p.m. Many firms paid off their men in the spring with a time check, good when the logs got down the river to the sawmills. They were redeemable immediately at the company office in Minneapolis. Often time checks were bought up at a substantial discount by speculators from the thirsty lumberjacks who were anxious to get their money for liquor.